Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Moving Mission Critical Systems to the Cloud to Transform IT, a Department of <coughs> Justice panel. My name is Nikki Williams. I'm a business development uh, manager for the AWS GovCloud region. And I work closely with our government and regulated industry customers as well as systems integrators, um, consulting and technology partners in terms of building general awareness of the region, understanding capabilities that we need to bring in to uh, support our customers uh, missions as well as future workloads and overall business growth strategy. We're very excited uh, this morning to have this very esteemed uh, group of executives from within the Department of Justice come in and uh, tell us a bit about their perspectives as well as lessons learned as it relates to Justice's uh, journey to the cloud. And uh, Justice is a, a very good example of a federal agency that was an early cloud adopter that really has leveraged cloud technology to drive their IT transformation for the agency. Um, it's a very large organization with over 40 components covering both uh, litigation as well as law enforcement. And these components are at various stages of maturity as it relates to cloud adoption. So they're doing everything from running uh, development and test environments to net new application development in the cloud, uh, digital property management, as well as analytics running mission critical applications and workloads in the cloud, as well as leveraging cloud for data center consolidation. In the last uh, two years, uh, the agency has closed 60% of its data centers, so approximately 67 of 110 of their data centers with plans to consolidate to uh, three data centers by 2019. So a very aggressive uh, schedule or aggressive plan as it relates to the agency. So um, these three leaders have had uh, very different roles in driving this strategy and are gonna offer some of their unique perspectives today. I'd like to introduce our panelists, uh, beginning with Mr. John Everett. John has been a member of the FBI Senior Executive Service for the past 10 years. During his tenure, he's managed every aspect of FBI information technology, including compute services, storage, data centers, cloud, and network communications throughout the FBI's worldwide IT enterprises. And that includes three classifications of IT enclaves. Also, Dr. Carl Mathias. Carl is the Chief Information Officer for the United States Marshal Service. He's responsible for providing information technology services and support to 7,600 U.S. Marshals employees, contractors, and task force officers spread across 475 sites with, throughout the United States and at eight overseas locations. Prior to joining the U.S. Marshals, he served at the Pentagon as the executive director of the 844th Communication Squadron, and then as the deputy chief information officer for headquarters Air Force. And Ms. Melinda Rogers, um, who is the chief information security officer at the Department of Justice, in this role, she leads a team of cybersecurity specialists providing services across the DOJ to include continuous monitoring and diagnostics, security operations and incidents response, cybersecurity tool implementation, and identity and access management solutions. Additionally, Melinda works across the federal government on security matters, coordinating efforts and influencing policy, addressing threats, and establishing capabilities. Welcome. Thank, Thank you very you. much for joining us this morning. So I, I thought we'd begin um, the discussion very generally, speaking about why cloud for DOJ. So many in government as well as industry are familiar with policy directives such as the Data Center uh, Optimization Initiative or DCOI, FATARA, as well as just general resource constraints that are, are really driving agencies to look towards IT optimization um, and shared services models and that type of thing. If you could uh, tell us a bit about uh, your organization's mission and what were some of the key drivers in your decision to move to the cloud, and in particular to AWS GovCloud. And uh, we can open with Melinda. Sure, good morning everybody. Um, so cloud is here, as I tell my security operations folks. Uh, historically, if you have ever worked as part of a SOC, we like, we like our borders, we like the perimeter, we like to know exactly where the walls are, and it, everything from within we protect, everything outside we sort of ignore and try to keep the bad guys from coming in, and we try to prevent the good stuff from leaving the department. But we are truly at an age where we're transforming how we do business. As a federal government as a whole, and also at justice, 
keeping up with technology, keeping our hardware, software current, uh, having a good refresh strategy in place, that's an operational challenge that while it may be an issue that we contend with, I think that's not um, isolated to the federal space. I suspect in private industry, uh, many companies struggle with that challenge as well. It's always the balance between outsourcing versus maintaining um, equipment on site. When do, you, when do you spin off commodity services potentially to those who do it best versus keeping those oper operational emission focus items internally uh, for your own management? It's a balance. I tell my SOC guys, we need to look hard at cloud, and it's here to stay. We have a chance to influence how we ultimately adopt a cloud approach within justice. This is our opportunity to shape it rather than to be dragged along from behind. So we want to be at the forefront. AWS and other cloud providers have been good partners in working with us, hearing our business requirements, and and supporting us in coming up with that new solution should look like so that at the end of the day, from a department perspective, we will be able to continue to maintain our visibility and monitoring where our assets are, what the configuration status might look like, what the patch status looks like, and ultimately be able to respond to incidents and manage them appropriately when they do occur. Thank you, excellent. So, uh, for those of you who, I, I'm going to apologize in advance, few of you have heard me tell this story, but uh, I'm going to start with a quick story and, and so you understand where I'm coming from. Uh, if you've read the book, Where the Red Fern Grows, uh, there is a story in there where uh, the boy Danny wants to train his dogs to hunt raccoons. Uh, trigger warning, this doesn't end well for the raccoon. But uh, he goes to his grandpa and he needs to, he's in a quandary, he has to have a raccoon in order to train the dogs to catch raccoons and he can't figure out how to catch one. So his grandfather says, well, it's simple. Drill a hole in an old log about that big and pound nails into it at an angle so that when, and then put something shiny in the bottom. When the raccoon comes up, it'll see the shiny thing and grab it and it won't be able to pull its paw out. And uh, Danny says, that's the dumbest idea I've ever heard. All he has to do is let go of the shiny thing. And uh, he says, you don't understand the nature of raccoons. Once a raccoon has a shiny thing, it will never let it go. And it began to occur to me that CIOs and raccoons have a lot in common <laughs> and that we like shiny stuff. And uh, <laughs> I'll admit, I'm guilty. Uh, so I, I get to a point in the Marshall service where I have uh, legacy hardware, old hardware, sitting in, and thankfully we had consolidated into uh, the DOJ data centers. We had no more of our own data centers, but the hardware was old. So the, the question was, okay, what's the next step here? Uh, FISMA High wasn't available on cloud service yet, so we made the decision to go ahead and purchase another round of hardware to move our applications into. But at that point, we set a goal that at the end of this hardware's life, we would get out of the hardware business completely and that we would exist in the cloud. Uh, so, uh, and, and not every organization can do this. This is the nature of our applications that allows us to do it. But what we have set this deadline and the, the staff knows and my staff that in four years, uh, if it isn't migrated to cloud, we're gonna kill it. And it, I think in that first year we've been at this, people are kind of going, are you really going to do that? And now, as we are in the, just about to field our first app into the cloud, uh, realizations hit, uh, the cultural change is in progress. Our strategy has been updated to reflect this. All of our operational plans have been updated to reflect this. People are going, this is going to happen. This is going to occur. So, that's kind of what's driven us is we had to make decisions and I wanted to get out of the hardware business. So the FBI uh, is relatively new to an enterprise approach to, uh, to going into the cloud. We formed a cloud program management office in January and for if you guys could raise your hand over here, uh, the cloud PMO, that, those are my folks. <laughs> Um, we're few and we're underfunded, but we get a lot done. So we started in January, uh, cloud first. We have three uh, classifications of our enclaves. We have a TS, a secret, and an unclass. We're moving to the cloud in all three of those uh, areas. Uh, we have um, the bulk of our 
of, our, of, of the FBI's workload is on the secret side, and uh, we're, we're doing what we can at this point, waiting for the secret C2S uh, cloud to come on board. Uh, we have about more than 300 applications. Some of those are really large that work on, uh, that will be on that, uh, that enclave, and we're working to uh, make sure that we are ready when that comes on board. Uh, unlike uh, some of the other uh, programs that we've had in the past, uh, virtualization and data center consolidation, uh, where we had a lot of pushback, um, moving to the cloud within the Bureau right now is, uh, is going relatively well. We have people knocking on the door uh, wanting to, to get moving because they, they see the value of it. And, and I think... Uh, the most transformative thing their bureau can do since I've been here uh, is probably move to the cloud because it will give us uh, more opportunities in terms of uh, getting out of the hardware business, getting out of the maintenance business, being able to expand and uh, and scale to the to the to the uh, extent that we need to do when we have uh, bad things happen in the world like the Boston bombing and other things that we need to. We need to move out quickly and, and have more infrastructure than we do right now. Excellent. And certainly um, appreciate you guys sharing those initial thoughts. Um, one thing that's very consistent in your comments about really that ability to trade that capital expenditure for operational expenditures and, and uh, really realizing the cost savings there, which is a major benefit of moving to the cloud. Um, uh, Carl hit on it uh, a little bit in your response when you talked about FISMA High. And I know for uh, my colleagues here at AWS, when we have conversations about GovCloud, typically the first uh, thing that's brought up is compliance, right? And FISMA High and FedRAMP High and how we're going to be able to uh, support them in meeting some of these strict compliance requirements. Uh, GovCloud is AWS's isolated region that really allows our customers with very strict and regulatory, uh, very strict regulatory and compliance requirements to run workloads uh, in the cloud, and of course, we offer things such as FedRAMP High, Criminal Justice Information Services of Sieges, which is very uh, familiar to folks up here. Uh, things like DOD SRG 1075, FIPS 140 2 endpoints, and, and various other regimes. And so, through this shared uh, responsibility model, both uh, government agencies as well as um, pro technology providers are able to inherit these compliance features to really support them in um, meeting compliance requirements and accelerating the path to authorization. And so I'd ask uh, you, Melinda, <coughs> DOJ has had tremendous success in executing against an accelerated cloud adoption strategy even while enforcing some of the most stringent compliance requirements. Can uh, you speak a bit about how GovCloud allows DOJ to meet uh, security and compliance requirements for your most sensitive workloads, and what were some of the concerns in migrating to the cloud, and how did GovCloud help you overcome them? Oh, absolutely. Um, so, Nikki, I know you mentioned earlier there, there's, a, there's no shortage of security compliance requirements, but I, I personally, um, I, I, when I, one says the word compliance, it sort of makes me cringe a little bit because it has such a negative connotation, right? But at the end of the day, we're trying to do the right thing. We wanna make sure that we maintain the availability of data integrity, right? And it's not just about checking the box, but ultimately, do you have the right IT infrastructure? Do you have the most optimized uh, environment, the refresh schedule, so that you always have sort of the most current technology? It might not be the latest shiny toy, Carl, right? But it's the best that you can. It's the best value that, that you have in place. Um, in terms of um, what we have done to leverage uh, AWS's GovCloud, uh, one of our requirements is to make sure at the department level or at the, at the component level as well, the data must reside in the United States. That's not a requirement that applies to everybody, but we are the Department of Justice. We do need that information to stay within uh, the United States, and we allow only U.S. citizens to access our IT systems, um, and for a variety of reasons that I won't bore you guys for today. So for th those are just some of those examples where, in working with um, GovCloud, we have established a new best baseline that GovCloud is able to support the Department of Justice to adhere to what's important for us from a policies and procedures standpoint, but also allow the mission operators like Carl and John 
to maximize the utility of their infrastructure. So I would say I th it, primarily for, from my perspective, it's the dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, AWS might think it's the NIST 853 controls, but the reality is we have a few other things besides just mm -hmm. the standard NIST controls. What are they until we have that dialogue and engage in that partnership discussion? They won't know what that really looks like and how important they are to us. And, um, and so far, I would say it's not just AWS, but other cloud partners that uh, DOJ has worked with so far. Everybody has been very supportive in trying to understand our mission, what our requirements are, and doing what's within their business capability to support us in those efforts. Thank you uh, so much for that. And so the balance um, that has to take place between meeting compliance requirements and then also, as you spoke about meeting, um, the actual objectives of the mission owners and this dichotomy between speed and agility that cloud is supposed to offer and then the actual process of media compliance and going through the ATO process is something that's not always um, very, very smooth. So I'd like to um, get jo John and Carl's perspectives um, as it relates to any initiatives that might be underway at the individual component level to instantiate some type of accelerated ATO process or ways in which you're working uh, directly to, um, you know, essentially make it a more uh, feasible process, less time consuming. So um, we're undergoing a, a major modernization effort and uh, that effort is going to go direct to cloud. And so this discussion uh, has occurred from the beginning and continues to occur today. Uh, so let me add a little context. Uh, as we talked about you know, getting out of the hardware business, moving to cloud, uh, my organization, we've also uh, taken another journey in parallel. Uh, we're moved to an agile environment and uh, hope to move in the next two years to a DevOps environment. And so one of the things we're scratching our head on is how do you get that ATO done in, you know, the, the customer's time frame would be I want it now. Uh, you know, if I talk to my CISO, he's like, hold up a second, uh, you know, let's not so fast. Uh, so here's, here's some of the things we're doing, uh, and I, I won't lie to you, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to pretend we have the, all the answers. We're still learning. Uh, the first thing we've learned is embed the ISO in with your scrum teams. Uh, because one of the things that does is as those scrum teams and those infrastructure teams are having the discussion, if you've got an ISO sitting in there participating in the discussion or at least overhearing it, they can inject that uh, compliance slash security mindset in right from the beginning of the development, which means you're not waiting to the end where somebody would throw it over the wall at the cybersecurity team saying, hey, I need an ATO. And yeah, you could be looking at months then. Uh, so having that in there means that we shorten that time frame up right there because we're working on those deliverables, those documents, those anything re involving compliance as the development is, is proceeding, uh, as the sprints are occurring. Additionally, we found that setting your boundaries correctly on your security accreditation is very, very important. Uh, you've got to be careful not to focus too narrowly so that you're re just reinventing the wheel every time you've got to push a new product out. So we've, we've taken a strategy there. Uh, I, I, but we're not to the, we're n you know, we're nowhere close to the 24-hour ATO I keep hearing about. Um, and I'm, I'll be honest, uh, from, from a, you know, a, a law enforcement perspective and knowing what's in our data, I'm not even sure I want that. Uh, I think I want care as we proceed forward to make sure that uh, we are protecting our information because people's lives are truly at stake with what we have. So not so fast is the first thing they teach ISOs when they go to school. Uh, and we have uh, the, the same kind of problem in the Bureau, although our approach is very similar to what marshals are doing. Uh, we would like to be able to have um, the security process keep pace with, uh, with the cloud movement, with our development, and with our, with our operations, so we're not waiting for uh, an ATO once an application is either ready to move or it's been developed and is ready to go into production. So it's been a struggle for, for us to try to figure out that balance mm -hmm. and, and to have the, uh, the concept that we can get it as quickly as we can and to get most of the, or get the paperwork and, and, the, and the process moving, especially in the, in the development environment, 
to have the security folks working hand in hand with the developers. Uh, we have also moved to an agile uh, approach to, to doing not just software development, but for uh, program management. And we have uh, a security person that works directly on, on our team to help make sure that we're in lockstep as we move forward. And Nikki, if I could just yeah, uh, add to the comment here, I was thinking about the ATO part. Uh, 24 hours, it, it sort of begs the question, how big of a scope are you really assessing and you know, how good of a job are you right. doing, right? So it's not 24 hours maybe, and it's probably not three months either. So where is the utopia that's somewhere right. in between? And it's a balance if you have a large complex system handling mission essential functions or personnel right. information, you do want to spend that extra time. And if it's something that's a web service, a uh, public facing website, then of course that's a much right. lesser um, uh, lift. Uh, I do want to mention we do leverage some internal tools on asset inventory management. So at the end of the day, could we, should we, we should be leveraging more of the information that we glean from that to automate the ATO approval process. Because I still think today, I'm, Carl, I don't know how you feel about this, and I know we have other DOJ members in the audience too, Walter, but you know, you have sort of the, the ATO process which is going down that NIST 853 controls, but to what degree should we be leveraging the fact that we have asset management tool to satisfy CM8 because we have insight into all of our components, not component agencies, but IT components. Should we be leveraging that automation that we have for looking at our security posture and taking credit on the ATO side? So I think we have opportunities for improvement on that front. Yeah, so, and, and Nikki, one other thing uh, we should mention is, you know, we're not operating in a vacuum either because we're constantly talking with Melinda's team and taking, you know, looking at the direction coming from there, helping to form that, making sure we're staying compliant with it. So. You know, when I talk and when she's talking, uh, we're, it's hand in hand. It has to be in order to be successful. So I, I just want to make that clear. Excellent. So yeah. certainly leveraging uh, assets or, or leveraging some of the compliance work that's already happening within the agency, um, right-sizing the ATO process for the type of workload, and, and even beyond um, you know, looking at reciprocity and, and opportunities for that to, to shorten the ATO process. One of the things that uh, both uh, John mentioned, is, as well as you, call is alluding to DevOps and to creating a DevOps culture um, within government and um, integrating the ATO process or embedding the ATO process um, within that culture. And so we're, we're increasingly seeing customers with net new program requirements and modernization efforts that are making the decision to begin architecting in the cloud and uh, really taking it at, at taking the advantages of architecting um, in the cloud or realizing those advantages right from the beginning. And Carl Marshall Service is really um, a, an excellent example, and you guys are undertaking a massive application modernization initiative, the Mission Modernization Program. Uh, what were the most influential factors in making the decision to modernize on a cloud-based architecture, and how is this approach supporting or benefiting Marshall Service whether it be uh, operational performance, scheduling cost, uh, performance, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, um, so just some context here. Uh, our warrant and prisoner tracking system uh, was, is a million lines of Java, you know, and it's some old Java too. So, uh, so uh, you know, it, it was, it hit end of life cycle. It had all the classic issues associated with uh, end of life cycle software. So we had to make a decision. Are we going to just rewrite uh, our prisoner tracking system and our warrant system and create an exact replica in a new language or the old language rewritten? Uh, or do we rethink the whole thing and we decided uh, let's rethink everything. Let's not just make a stovepipe for prisoner tracking and warrants. Let's build a platform for automation across the marshals, something that uh, regardless of the workflow or process that we could use that platform. And so that's the approach we've taken uh, and that's the system we're building. So. When you know, I talked about I kind of want to get out of the hardware business here, and, and so we were looking at having to replace legacy hardware. Well, as we, uh, we initially thought that there was, a, there was no FISMA high offering, and our data is definitely falling into that category, we thought we would have to go to that new set of hardware I was buying. 
Uh, but when FISMA High became available, we were going, you know, the, it was obvious. Why move twice? I'd go to my hardware and then I'd go to cloud. That made no sense. So that's when we made the decision, yeah, let's go straight to cloud. Uh, let's, let's go ahead and, and, and put it in there. So uh, in two weeks, uh, we're going to field our first workflow into the cloud. Uh, and strangely enough, it has nothing to do with prisoner tracking and warrants. It's back to that automation platform. It's uh, an internal affairs, discipline management workflow. Uh, why do that? Well, because first, why go cloud? Well, first, uh, architectural flexibility. Uh, one of the issues we run into, and yes, we're a VM shop, uh, but we still run into the issue of if you size your server too small, you're, still, you're stuck with it if you bought the server, mm -hmm. and I don't like that. So uh, the architectural flexibility of saying, uh, if I make a mistake from a hardware point of view, it's not a permanent mistake in the cloud. We like that. So we can fix, because we will make mistakes. That's just the nature of this business. This allows us to correct those errors and move on without a huge expenditure or, or waste to the taxpayer. Uh, second thing, uh, we get into agility. And I know uh, you, you just referred to that, John, about being able to, OK, if we have a sudden requirement, we need to flex up in processing speed, or once a quarter we need to do something. Uh, we have the ability to reach out and say, I need more compute, and off we go. So, you know, a couple of key things there we're looking at. And then uh, down, and less, I know this will sound strange, but less of an issue for us was we saw this as a, uh, we saw this as cost neutral, but in the long term, cost avoidance, cash cost savings, because I can say, if I don't need my dev test environment this week, I can just turn it off. Uh, and not pay for it. You know, we're nowhere near in our cultural progress to the ability where we have the discipline to do that, but we see down the road that we'll have the ability to optimize how we use those cloud services to achieve cost savings. And, and so we, while I don't look for that to be dramatic, it wasn't the driving reason, uh, it, it is a factor. Thank you. Um, and uh, John, if you'd like to talk something. From the perspective of, um, a DevOps environment, or, or development in particular. Um, traditionally and historically, we've had uh, very disparate uh, ways of doing that. There was no consolidation. Uh, people would build a code in stovepipes and they would keep it uh, on location or in a data center or somewhere else. Uh, but what we need to go to and where we're headed is a, is a a cloud development environment where we have uh, uh, code repositories and standard tools uh, that uh, uh, we need to have so that we can do it from an enterprise perspective and with that security wrapper that goes with it so that uh, as we developed as we develop a new system or a new application we can move directly into one of the three different uh, classifications of enclaves that we that we currently have so um that's a, a perfect uh, segue with speaking about the three different uh, classifications of uh, enclaves that FBI currently has to so talk a bit about IT strategy um, and, and policy. So we've been discussing, or alluded to at least a bit, about how there are multiple, multiple components of DOJ that are at different stages of maturity um, with respect to cloud. And FBI is a really um, interesting example because in a way you're almost a, a a microcosm of what's happening generally across the agency in that you're running websites like FBI.gov in the cloud. You're also leveraging uh, cloud to run mission critical applications and workloads and using it um, as a driver for uh, to support your data center consolidation efforts. And then there's the complexity of running in a multi-level security environment. Uh, so you know you have to contend with multiple dynamics. What are some of the greatest uh, challenges that you've had to work through uh, at the FBI in terms of formulating a cohesive cloud strategy? Besides being relatively new, uh, we don't have, uh, we're working right now, to, we need a governance process, which we're working on. We need mm -hmm. uh, architecture and strategy, which, we, which I think we have a good handle on. So we know that we have some data and some systems that we don't want to put in the cloud because just of the sensitivity uh, classification and that type of thing that, uh, that it runs on. And so we'll keep that um, 
uh, on a, uh, an on-premise cloud, which we are uh, in the process of building, uh, but we'll use a, a combination of on-premise cloud, uh, commercial cloud, and gov cloud, that type of thing, to meet the needs of, uh, of the Bureau across all, well, the, the unclass uh, applications in particular, but the, on the secret and TS side, we're going to stay with, uh, with the secret C2S and, uh, and the, uh, um, the TS side that we got, uh, that we're piggybacking off with, uh, with our other agency partners. Excellent. So, um, and I'll actually direct this follow-up towards Melinda and Carl if you have something to add. So it's obvious that you've got different components like FBI that are out and they're actually building and executing um, on a cloud strategy. And uh, at the agency level, you have the difficult task of, of uh, formulating a, a comprehensive strategy, but that's still gonna be flexible enough to allow the individual mission owners to do what they need to do in terms of their unique um, you know, needs and requirements. And so in managing all of this um, from an enterprise perspective or agency perspective, how is the use of cloud management tools, um, in, in AWS's case, things like CloudWatch and CloudTrail and AWS Config, but how effective has the use of these tools been in streamlining elements of DOJ's IT policy and you know, being able to force transparency, et cetera? Want me to take a stab at that? Yeah, All absolutely. Right, so, and, then, <laughs> and then we'll go to Carl. And then we go, okay. So I would say, I would, uh, in full transparency, we're still very much at the nascent stage of mm -hmm. leveraging these different capabilities provided by the cloud service providers. We are truly in a transformative stage, at least not just from the pure IT operations and leveraging cloud capabilities, but also from an IT security, from a cybersecurity standpoint, we are changing how we do business. We are outsourcing a lot more, we're, out, we're doing managed services a lot more. We've always had the managed service model to a certain degree for different capabilities, but now as we look at moving more and more of our different stacks out, how do we come up with sort of, that's your point, that shared service concept? For what it's worth at Justice, this is not our, our first time at shared service. We have a, at least within the cyber arena, we have an application that tracks FISMA inventory tools that we not only use ourselves, but we actually have 19 other federal agencies participate in that. So we've done this before. We are able to work collaboratively across the federal government, working within the components, each with their own different mission, U.S. attorneys versus U.S. marshals, very different business needs, but yet some commonalities. I'd say at the end of the day, from my perspective, I think having a good partnership is key, is having an open dialogue, you know, calling ATF or vice versa, and you know, Walter will call me, why, why can't I you know, use this express route? I'll just use, pick that as an example. Let's have a discussion. There's no reason why they can't, we can't share the same pipe to leverage the cloud service that we, we all end up using at the end of the day. Uh, I think it is about leveraging cloud, uh, leveraging shared services where we can, and it's not a one size fits all, and it's a work in progress in terms of coming up what that common denominator looks like and then creating that flexibility for the mission operators to do what they need to do to be successful. Thank you. Um, anything that you gentlemen would like to add? I, I think from our perspective, one of the benefits for us is standardization in terms of development and use because we don't have, we, we, ha we know what the, what, the, what the product is and what, mm -hmm. the, uh, and what it offers us and we, we're not uh, stuck with Trying to trying to deal with uh, with different applications or, or and that type of thing in the cloud, I will say though um, uh, the FBI right now has has two cloud providers. We have AWS and we have your competitor. Uh, you can edit that out. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, and, and it's not a competitive thing as much as it, as it is a flexibility for for us we, because we believe that there are some workloads that will go better. Uh, in another cloud, and and so we're 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 keeping the uh, the uh, the playing field open to some degree. Although we focused uh, very much on on AWS, and that's where our focus is right now because we have all of our partners in, in that uh, in that ballpark. But um, we need we need that flexibility. Mm -hmm. Um, and so in a few remaining uh, minutes, I'd like to talk a bit about data management. Um, there's been an increased focus on data and data management, and you know, now lately over here it's all about the data. Um, and it's become a preeminent consideration in security and software services. And you know, from an AWS perspective, 
Um, 80 to 90 percent of what ends up in the GovCloud roadmap is driven directly what, from, by what we hear from our customers in terms of what their requirements are and, and um, their demands as it relates to upcoming workloads. So you'll see that reflected through service offerings such as Elastic Map Reduce and Redshift and Kinesis, um, as well as relational database service. One impact uh, has the availability of cloud-based data analytics and database solutions had on DOJ's data management strategy. And that, that's open uh, to the panel. Whatever would like to take a stab at it. Um, well, I'm, I'm probably not gonna give you the answer you wanna hear, um, <laughs> to be honest with you. So, uh, look, uh, we're relatively new moving into the cloud, so I'll be the first to recognize my vision is limited. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, the Marshalls recently hired in a, a chief data officer and we formed a staff under her uh, because we recognize that our data truly is an asset that we need to use more effectively. Um, that said, uh, what it, it, in putting that together, I, I'm, I'm, what I want to say is that We've, we're not really, uh, we're tool agnostic when it comes to, an environment agnostic when it comes to doing data analytics. So when I look at what will we get from the cloud at this point, I have a very simplistic answer for you and that is, well, flexibility and storage. Uh, there are times when we're gonna wanna flex up to do a, a massive analytics problem, for example. Um, where do we best position a task force to go get the most violent offenders off the streets in a certain set of cities? Uh, that's a that's a fairly significant problem we have to work uh, you know there's other problems similar to that in, in nature uh, but you know there are a lot of good effective tools out there that it I could run them on premise I could run them in the cloud uh, just the what the cloud offers me is a convenient place to park a lot of data uh, mm -hmm. to be honest with you the problem we run into then is well if I need to bring that data back out of the cloud, uh, that's, uh, that invokes a cost, and we're always thinking about that. And like, okay, uh, what's our cost benefit here of this? So we're still struggling with this problem, to be honest. It, to me, I haven't seen the, the, the benefits so much as I have seen some of the issues we're gonna have to deal with as we go through it. Thank you for that. Um, and so I believe um, we do have time for a, uh, a couple questions from the audience. If we have any questions for our panelists that would like to be asked. Okay, we've got the lights a little blinding, but all right. <laughs> Hello. Hi, um, Elliot Hong, TSA. How are you? Good, how are you? Thanks for this forum, very informative. So you're all dealing with, a, in an agency where you're dealing with threats like mine. And so it's great to see that you're moving to the cloud and leveraging the services there to help you with dealing with that. I'd like to know uh, if you're taking a look at AI as a future capability to help you with that. And also if you're looking at how you're gonna deal with the ATO of that technology. So, I, I feel compelled to answer because of those three letters, ATO and security. So I'll take a stab at it. I think artificial intelligence, uh, absolutely, there's even a place for cybersecurity as we ingest billions of data elements. What are we doing with that information? How are we sifting through it to find that nugget of gold to tell us what's really interesting and where is our perpetrator and how long they've potentially been, been hiding in our environment. So I think the, the art of the possible is certainly there. I think right now for our purposes, um, is to get a, a, a change how we do business, transform from our traditional way of monitoring our assets internally and coming up with a ramp, if you will, to start monitoring cloud assets more effectively. And what I mean by that is not just cloud assets from the FBI or just U.S. Marshals, but holistically, what is that DOJ footprint out at AWS or Microsoft or elsewhere? I'd say that right now is my more immediate focus. Artificial intelligence, I think the art of the possible is there. I actually came from a, a one of the credit bureaus where they ingest large volumes of data to look at the, for example, the credit score. So I think there's some commonalities there. It, it, it's, it's an interesting world. I think we're, we're still very much at the beginning of it and there's a lot more that can come, yeah. Hi, uh, this is Srinivas Gandhi from IRS. Uh, I have a question. 
do you have any reservations of putting your crown jewels in Gao Cloud? Uh, or you have a strategy in place of what type of data does go in a uh, government cloud versus your in-house? From the Bureau's perspective, we will look at uh, an application by application view. Uh, and as I said before, there are some things that we will not put in the cloud. We'll, we'll have our own on-premise cloud that, that were developed. So uh, it, it really depends on the data uh, and the sensitivity of that application as to whether or not it goes into the cloud. Uh, for the marshals, uh, as I've stated, I'm, you know, I'm looking to go lock, stock, and barrel for the most part into the gov cloud. Uh, we have no plans to look at commercial cloud at this point, but I'm not ruling it out. Uh, you know, I, you know, it's uh, not an exact adage, but you know, you don't protect your, you know, your gravel at the same level you protect your diamonds, I suppose. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so if I got some gravel out there, uh, let me maybe there's a more cost-effective way to place to put that and, and a lower level of protection required. Uh, but at this point, when we evaluate our data, we're saying GovCloud uh, is where we're headed. How about DOJ? It's same balance. You want, I think right now, we have plenty of work to move out to commercial cloud services, whether it's publicly hosted websites, um, learning management systems, uh, sort of, we, ha we have plenty of sort of what, what I call FISMA mediums and lows. There's, we're, we're just going to stay busy on that and uh, leave the highs and the mission essentials for phase two. Thank you. What applications and functions are being evaluated for public and commercial cloud? And if there are any, um, what support do you need from the contractor base? I'm sorry, repeat your question one more time. What applications and functions are being evaluated for public and commercial cloud as opposed to GovCloud? And if so, what type of support type do of you need from <laughs> all these guys? Um, from a department level, I, it's, it's the tried and true security assessment. What I mean by that, I don't mean just the security controls in this, but really we look at the, to what degree is the data protected, confidentiality, integrity, and availability from a, really from an operator's perspective, it, common sense. Um, we don't like the bad reputation of creating long ATO processes that's, you know, loudly and, you know, articulated loudly and clearly, and we know that we want <clears throat> to expedite the process, but where the, I think the contractor support community can really be helpful to us is how do we go about things differently, smartly, more quickly. We're absolutely open to doing things differently. I think it's just doing it, you know, taking calculated, good calculated risks. Yeah, hi. What are, what's your plan to manage and control costs? Is that, do you have a preference? Uh, whoever <laughs> has a good plan is, uh, <laughs> that'd be great. Yeah. Well, let's see. So we're supposed to have a plan for this? Um, yeah. You know, um, we actually uh, had to think through that, that problem because uh, you know, cloud's so new to us, uh, forecasting expenditures is, is a problem. And so what we're uh, um, trying to do, and I, 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 I steal a quote here, I think, from uh, Mark Schwartz over at DHS of the strangle uh, approach where you uh, strangle off an old, old system and put it in, as you go into the cloud. And that's more or less the approach we're taking is uh, as we uh, move functionality into the cloud, we're actually de we're eliminating functionality out of old legacy systems and trying to move some of that uh, money that was spent on that old function over into to compensate for cloud. Uh, there's no getting away from there's an initial hurdle to go cloud. You can't, you know, there is. Uh, but once we've, you know, the idea we're, we've got and the plan we have phases out the old stuff as we bring in the new, we should hit a, a, a you know, at the worst case is a wash for us is, is how we're looking at it. But like I mentioned before, I think long term, uh, if we're smart and we truly get cloud savvy and get that in the culture, we'll see a cost savings down the road or at least a cost avoidance. I really hate the four or five year cycle of going through capital equipment replacement. It's just, you know, uh, you're in, you know, uh, I'm no good at groveling and that's what I have to do, you know, so. so. The, uh, 
the Bureau is, is working hard to try to overcome the, the uh, or, or move toward or from a, a CapEx to an OpEx kind of uh, funding system uh, or strategy. Uh, we really are trying to take a hard look at, uh, again, on an application by application basis, what we think it would cost to go to move that uh, either um, lift and shift into the cloud or develop it uh, in, a, in a new architecture form. Um, the issue is um, right now as we, be, as we begin our FY18 planning for, for budget, um, the folks that own those applications um, uh, aren't necessarily planning for that move. So we've got to educate them and get them on board so they can take a look at, uh, at cost estimates. Uh, and so that they can get into the budget, so there's, they're, they're not uh, they're not left uh, kind of flat-footed when when we begin the, the new budget cycle. And then from the department level, the monitoring costs and the incident response costs they they're still there. We, instead of maybe spending it on source A, we spend it on source B. But how do we effectively support that transition as we move workloads into the cloud. And I think this is one where I mentioned earlier the partnerships and we want to continue that discussion <clears throat> because if there are monitoring capabilities that are available natively, obviously that would be the optimal solution, but it's got to give us sort of the same level of robustness that we had on site and it's a, it's a work in progress. Um, we may have time for one additional question. I, uh, I work at a GSE and uh, I, I think I sense a general feeling that all of us are very reluctant to put our crown jewel, if you would, on the cloud. But again, I don't own any stock in Amazon or the competitor, but the question I think Melinda to you is, what would make us comfortable to put our crown jewels out on the cloud? I, um it's, it's not one answer. I think it's having the right security posture. I actually, I'm not opposed, I'm personally not opposed to it, but it, it's gotta look right, right? So it depends on what type of application, what type of data, how do we, use, how do we need to use it, what's the resiliency. Um, we're actually moving a lot of our workloads. I'm not saying I'm holding back on the crown jewel, but I think right now we, we have more lessons to learn, honestly, and even in our moderate and low systems that, uh, I think the future is there. It's just, uh, you know, I think it, you guys, well, you guys already have the FISMA high infrastructure right. in place. Right now, I have enough workload in front of me to get the things that I can save on out, and that's where I'm prioritizing my time. And then when I get to the, the harder stuff, maybe uh, somebody bigger and better can uh, take on that challenge. And uh, I'd argue the opposite. Um, and. Uh, Okay, uh, this will be on YouTube, right? Roger Beasley, I'm giving ATF credit, okay, because I'm always telling how we like to see ATF in the rearview mirror. That's you said general. it in That's public now, I know. <laughs> okay, so uh, the f folks at ATF make a very good el eloquent argument about why actually going to GovCloud is a safer environment for your crown jewels than to keep it in our own data centers. Um, and, and I agree with this argument, and that is, you know, a, a company like Amazon's entire brand is dependent on preventing a breach from occurring. Uh, if a massive breach occurs in AWS, and I'm not saying it will, I'm just saying that it's a severe hit to the brand, uh, you know, the company takes a corporate hit as a whole, they're not going to allow this to happen, so they can invest all kinds of money and into the right people who can engineer that and keep it running, keep it secure at a level that you know the U.S. Marshals couldn't hope to compare with. Uh, you know, and and uh, DOJ does a great job, but even I would argue above what DOJ can do because you've got this corporate requirement that this be secure. So in a sense. Uh, you know, when we look at GovCloud and they've met the FedRAMP certification uh, and Amazon's putting these resources behind it and their brand is dependent on it, I'd say it's a pretty good place to put your crown jewels. Uh, you still have to do your own homework. You still have to do your own security stuff. I'm not saying you don't do that. I'm just saying there's a whole lot behind that that Amazon's putting against it. A company like Amazon. Other companies, I can't endorse just one company, okay, but other companies do the same thing. So. 
So, uh, and to your point, absolutely, um, you know, AWS, that we are, as a brand, very dependent uh, uh, in terms of maintaining security, and we have made very heavy investments, uh, to Carl's point, uh, at times probably over and beyond what individual agencies or commercial entities would be able to do um, themselves. On top of all of the uh, compliance features that we offer, to our customers and, uh, you know, not even just ATF, but I believe we've had other customers such as GE from Capital One, uh, excuse me, the CIO from uh, Capital One attest to the fact that he himself believes that they're much safer running in AWS than running in their own data centers. So um, I appreciate uh, that comment from you, Mr. Mathias. Uh, so, uh, I'm not and being paid. <laughs> So um, in, in, I guess, closing out uh, our session, I just want to cap on a, a few things that uh, I thought were excellent points and themes from our discussion today. Um, clearly, uh, DOJ is looking at using cloud as a way to reduce costs and get out of the hardware business, which we heard uh, several times, and really as a way to force standardization in the, uh, across the agency. And I, I love what uh, you said earlier, Melinda, about compliance not necessarily being about just checking the box, but looking at compliance from a different perspective and leveraging it actually to drive optimization across um, your organizations. Certainly, uh, from a DevOps perspective, leveraging cloud to architect for uh, flexibility and cost avoidance, and really the importance of embedding uh, security experts and security professionals from your organizations in that development process very early on to be able to accelerate the ATO process and work through whatever issues uh, uh, there might be. So uh, certainly appreciate those um, thoughts and, and words of wisdom. And so I, to close out the panel, of course, we want to look a little bit ahead, right, to where DOJ might be going. From an AWS perspective, uh, we're doing a lot uh, lately in looking at things like uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And I believe we had a question um, from the audience about that and looking towards serverless architectures. And, you know, that's where we sort of see the space going and customers, uh, the direction that they're driving us in. And you see this through uh, tools that are being made available like uh, recognition and API gateway and Lambda and that sort of thing. Um, how are these technologies shaping where justice uh, and general marshals, FBI are gonna be going in the future? What does cloud 2.0 look like for the agency? I, I'll give it a quick stab. I think better, much better intelligence, again, on the data front. From, like I said earlier, from a security operations center standpoint, we collect so much data, we haven't even begun to tap a fraction of what's, uh, what could potentially uh, be useful in that arena. I'd say security operations as a service, there's um, a push even across the federal landscape of consolidating that. But by consolidation, doesn't necessarily mean that it's done on premise. It could be leveraging cloud capabilities and cloud providers to optimize that particular service. So, I th um, right now, things are changing so much and so quickly that I think two years from now, three years from now, even I would say security operations is going to look very different from mm -hmm. uh, how we look today. I'm going to pass to John. I'm, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate uh, you guys taking some time to speak with us this morning. Um, appreciate our audience for being very uh, attentive and having excellent questions. Uh, please enjoy uh, the rest of the conference and have a wonderful day. Thank you.